You nearly made it, the end of the, end of the conference. I don't know about you, I feel like my brain's full. I've learned so much wonderful stuff. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, using the Torque JavaScript library for uh, creating time-lapse animations uh, with our own database that's uh, outside of uh, the Cardo DB service. Um, I'm Catherine Killebrew. I'm a software developer at the geospatial firm Azavia in Philadelphia. Um, before I get started, I'd like to point out that the slides uh, are linked to from the session page. Uh, so if you care to go check that out, uh, I've got some links in, th in there to things that you might find uh, interesting or useful. So uh, what is this Torque library? Um, it's part of the uh, suite of open source projects that uh, make up uh, the CardoDB uh, stack. Uh, it's used for creating time series animations uh, in the browser. Um, it renders uh, on a slippy map. Uh, you can uh, zoom and pan around on your map while the animation is playing and it'll continue to play. It's pretty neat. Uh, so there's three different ways to uh, create a Torque animation. The most straightforward is to simply go into the CardoDB account, upload your data, uh, sometimes it has a, a point column and uh, a timestamp and an ID uniquely identifying each object you want to track. Microphone. Sorry, okay. <laughs> so uh, upload your data into CardoDB. You've got um, object identifier for each thing you want to track. So for example, of uh, buses, you want to have an ID for each bus uh, so it can create the animations uh, uh, for its passage uh, over time. And then simply select the Torque Animation option from the wizard, and um, there you go. Uh, there's your animation. And then you can also go to share that animation and get the option to um, embed it as an iframe uh, on your website. Super easy to use. Um, so there it is um, in, the, in the options. Recently, CardoDB blogged that they've uh, added back the heat map option for Torque animations, which is also pretty neat. Um, so you can create those as well as uh, as the sort of contrails fading over time as uh, objects move around. So uh, there, there's this JavaScript library. Um, it's got a bunch of examples in it and uh, documentation on how to use it. And basically it's set up so that you can connect to a table that's in a CardoDB account. You just give in uh, your, your CardoDB account um, a visualization ID and it'll go plug into that and uh, create your animation so you can set up all of your uh, uh, Torque configuration in your own web page and uh, configure it that way. It'll work on top of a leaf leaflet or a Google Maps space map. And it's just another layer that you throw on there. Um, so that's pretty great. Um, there's a third option, which is to take this uh, Torque JavaScript library and to set it up with our own database. Uh, so that's what I'm going to talk about today. So. Uh, Torque is one of these JavaScript libraries that makes up the Cardo DB stack. Uh, in particular, it depends on two of the other libraries in the Cardo DB stack. One is the tiling service, uh, Windshaft, which is pretty neat. It connects directly to your database, uh, so it's dynamic. As soon as the data in your database updates, you get new tiles. Um, no messing with the cache, it's just there. Uh, the other is the SQL API, uh, which is what it is. A little scary. You can send in arbitrary SQL and it'll run on your table. Um, so, uh, the Torque animation itself is configured with some special Cardo CSS. Since Windshaft uses Mapnik, it's using the Cardo CSS style sheets uh, for configuration. So, we get some special Torque flavored uh, Cardo CSS for de defining aspects of the animation and how that displays. Uh, so, um, just to give a brief overview of the, the larger CardoDB stack, you get a website, that's uh, a, a Ruby uh, website, that uh, when a user account gets created, it creates a new database for each user, um, creates a bunch of uh, triggers and functions on the database, and um, each uh, account gets referred to with a subdomain, and that's how CardoDB figures out uh, which account it should be looking at, just by inspecting that subdomain. And uh, then there's the SQL API that gets used internally for uh, querying things. Uh, whenever you go uh, put in a query into the interface, that's, that's what it's using. And then there's the Windshaft library that's actually rendering the tiles for you. And Windshaft uh, is um, uh, really easy to use by itself uh, outside of the larger stack. Um, the other aspects of uh, the CardoDB stack are fairly tightly integrated, um, sort of depend on uh, having one another around. So why, oh, why did I uh, bother setting up Torque to work on its own when it's so easy to just go throw your data into the CardoDB and uh, use it from there? I was working on a side project called CycleFilly. It's a mobile app for uploading 
uh, bicycling trips. So I get the GPS tracks from those, and then we share the data uh, with regional transit planners that they use to improve uh, cycling facilities. So I already had the data shoved into PostGIS database, a clean version of the data set, and I was using Windshaft to display uh, uh, the line strings for the trips, so people could go in and see, hey, look, here's what people are writing. It's pretty handy. So I thought, well, that's pretty cl close to the full torque setup. How much, how hard could it be? <laughs> um, so then I, I got started down the road of uh, setting up a torque animation. I first explored some other options. Uh, it's interesting, there's a QGIS plugin for uh, creating uh, time-lapse animations from a post-gist table. Uh, it works. It's a little slow, and I wanted to have a website uh, so, I could, so I could share the results. Uh, but that's also an option. It's fun to play with. I recommend checking it out as well. So how to go about this, how to set up Torque without having the full car to be set up. Um, so again, we just really need these uh, two other uh, node libraries, uh, the Windshaft Tyler and the SQL API. Um, so Torque itself we can use without modification. Same goes for Windshaft. Uh, the SQL API uh, was the one sort of hang up I ran into the, with this uh, because it expects to uh, find user credentials and Redis that are set by uh, the Ruby web service. Uh, so it looks up metadata information to figure out uh, what the permissions are, what, it can ac what the user can access uh, before actually passing uh, through the query. So I went in and ripped out the authentication stuff, which was scarily easy, um, and uh, instead rely on uh, database authentication uh, uh, for making sure that I'm not exposing anything extra. Um, and both Windshaft and SQL API are using Redis uh, for caching some information. Uh, so that is a dependency uh, for our setup. And the database itself is, is pretty straightforward. It's your standard uh, Postgres database with the Postgres extensions installed. Um, there were a few uh, extra um, functions uh, from one of the other CardaDB projects uh, that found necessary to install uh, on the database. Uh, so you have those available. And also uh, for the SQL API, uh, allow password authentication to the database. Um, assuming that they're both running locally, I could just do that uh, for local connections. And then for the table itself, it's pretty straightforward. You got the identifier for, again, that's for the object, not for each row, but for uh, each object we want to track over time. Uh, the timestamp uh, for the recording. And then uh, two different uh, point columns, two different projections, your standard WGS84 for the data. That's what the SQL API expects. And then uh, Windshaft uh, is looking for Web Mercator, so I can uh, render, a little, render a little quicker uh, uh, looking for that. And um, in setting this up, I ran into uh, one weird little thing. When I had just called ST transform to uh, transform my uh, WGS84 column into Web Mercator, I got no results. I just I had nothing, no output. So I thought that was strange. So on a whim, I thought I'd try this uh, Carter to be special function for transforming to Web Mercator. It looked like it was just checking the extent and correcting if you had weird things out by the poles. Um, I didn't think I had any in my data set, but once I called this function, everything was groovy. I had, I had great data. Um, animation was working. So that's one little gotcha you might want to look out for. So for the Windshaft configuration, uh, it's pretty, pretty simple. Um, there's some example uh, setups in uh, the config folder. Um, I've also got a gist I've shared here uh, for uh, Windshaft configuration. Uh, for Torque, it expects the, uh, the URL to say the same. It's possible to configure uh, Windshaft to take in different parameters in the URL that you can use for, uh, for dynamically changing uh, aspects of the, of the tiles that you get back. Uh, but for the Torque animation, it expects a very specific uh, URL, so you can't mess with that for the animation. So uh, once you plug in the uh, information for your database uh, connection, just a standard database name, tab uh, table, and uh, user credentials, and then uh, fire up the node service, and uh, there's your Tyler. Uh, SQL API uh, is pretty sim uh, similar uh, for the setup. There's some example uh, configuration uh, scripts need to be set up with uh, database uh, connection credentials. Uh, I've created a fork um, that has the credentials removed that depend on the Ruby uh, web service uh, Redis credentials. Um, so I've just stripped out those parts, and it just looks in the configuration file figure out what the database is instead of trying to find the subdomain for the user and all of that. Um, so uh, set that up. Uh, there's a health check uh, endpoint. Um, I'd recommend disabling it in production. It'll reveal uh, the username. Um, and then there's a 
a stats D service, uh, which I've removed from my use. Um, probably not going to be using that. And same way, uh, just fire off the node service, and we've got the SQL API uh, up and running. Um, so uh, here's some examples of uh, some of the time lapse animations I've created. Uh, I've got a couple of them for uh, the Cycle Philly project. And then I decided to uh, go looking for some public data so I could share uh, uh, some animations using public data sources. Uh, first, I looked to SEPTA, which is the regional transit agency for Philadelphia. Um, they've got some real-time data. It's not in the standard format, though. Um, hopefully, they're going to be uh, upgrading soon on their, uh, their radios for uh, real-time data, and we'll uh, get uh, some, some different uh, formatted real-time data. Uh, also, uh, Boston, which does use the GTFS uh, real-time format, um, I used uh, their data for some animations, uh, which is what's playing here. And uh, I've also shared a, a gist of how to read out the protobuf format and get out the four columns we need for creating an animation like this. So you could potentially use that with any of the agencies that use uh, GTFS real-time standard. Um, for the Carter to be a, a Torque account, uh, they've got a GitHub pages a setup with um, some interactive controls where you can play with the different torque animation uh, configuration parameters. Uh, so that's pretty fun. I'll go look at that now. Um, so there's different uh, configuration parameters here. If we uh, change the resolution, it's still loading. Uh, but if you change the resolution, um, it'll uh, uh, look a little more pixelated. And if it's uh, set really high, then you get more of a grid effect as it's combining together points uh, and reducing the resolution. Um, so if your points look weirdly gridded, then you might want to uh, look at reducing the, the resolution. And uh, the steps in animation duration uh, interact with each other. Um, so the number of discrete steps um, in the animation uh, increase or decrease them and it will uh, change the appearance of, of how it plays out over time. And it will create a nice uh, contrail effect that you can control with uh, uh, the fill values uh, for various offsets. So um, using that I uh, unique ID, it will figure out uh, where the point was at, at uh, previous offsets in the uh, uh, animation and uh, display the marker uh, differently based on that. Um, also, there's some different op options for the uh, uh, torque aggregation type. Uh, so you can display a cumulative animation. And also for the heat map, I believe it uses a different uh, linear aggregation type. Um, if you create a, a visualization in the CardaDB account, uh, you can go to the CSS pane and see what sort of a Carta CSS it generates for uh, different configuration parameters as well. OK. Um, so at this point, I could do a live demo and uh, walk through uh, some code. I'm just going to fire up wind shaft, which will uh, give some output on uh, the tiles being generated, and start the SQL API. And if you go to... Uh, a WinShaft server that's running to the top level, it'll say John Rambo. I don't know who John Rambo is, but this will tell you that the server is live, so it's good to know. And for the SQL API, um, uh, that's it. You get the SQL endpoint. Uh, you pass in your query parameter, which is just some SQL, and uh, there it is. And so... Okay, here's my local file. And when you start up the animation, uh, there's some interesting output that comes at the console. Um, you can see where it's uh, querying the SQL API. Uh, it's getting some initial data on what the bounds are and also what the uh, time range is that it needs to look at. And then it'll go fetch the tiles from WinShaft. So there's that. Uh, this is the animation for a uh, for Cycle Philly data. Um, one thing I liked about how this came out was that um, because it's very high resolution of data, um, it was producing a nice contrail effect. And this was just the, the wind shaft server with uh, the line strings for the chips, uh, all of them overlaid at once. <laughs> 
Okay, there we go. So you can watch the, the rides going on around. Um, that's the Schuylkill River Trail uh, up to the northwest. And this is a this is a few different uh, days of trips uh, overlaid onto each other to give a more exciting effect. Still haven't loaded. And so, um, okay. Um, uh, one thing to note uh, for uh, using Torque um, on your own web page is that um, there's some extra dependencies. Uh, if you go look in the uh, distribution folder, um, there's the Torque library itself. Also, um, if you uh, use it independently, there are a few other things that you'll want to grab. Um, uh, for my example, with the, the SEPTA bus animation, um, using jQuery, jQuery UI, uh, underscore, also, of course, leaflet and uh, a CSS for leaflet, and uh, the base Cardo library. Um, so that may not be immediately apparent from looking at the examples in the, the Torque, uh, Torque project. And uh, when I went in to remove the authentication uh, from the SQL API, uh, that's pretty much it. Um, it's just looking uh, directly into the, the settings file instead of uh, looking into Redis uh, for the uh, uh, user permissions. And then I'll open it up to questions. Okay, uh, well, thank you very much.